Welcome at our first session of practical ministry, this module, and uh, we're going to touch a lot of practical things, like we say practical ministry is about how to practically ministry, minister to people, and, and why, why we do it and how we do it. We talk about some practical things uh, about ministry that is very unique to what we want to be and what you are supposed to become. So we're going to start tonight with some great stuff. Before we get there, some work in your group. Uh, very easy stuff. Um, in your group, as you st sit in the group, quickly tell the rest of the people in your group, what is the single dream you have? Just one. Dream you have that haven't happened yet. A dream you have for your life that haven't manifested yet in your life. Just one. Don't tell us all 20. One specific dream you have in your heart that hasn't manifested yet. So tell the rest of the people. And I'm doing it by purpose because I want you to think in terms of your calling, what you believe God has called you for, what you want to do for God, uh, what do you believe God has made you for and called you. That's all that's happening in the coming weeks as we go into practical ministry in the next module, actually, vision and leadership, to, to get you to start, develop a vision of what, what are you here for? Uh, what is God's desire for your life that you will accomplish that and that you can get yourself in line of that? So what is the greatest dream or dr dream you have that is not being um, happening yet or fulfilled yet? Just share it with people. And it's actually a powerful way of uh, reinforcing what you believe might be the calling on your life. Then, when everyone did that in the group, I want you to, just for about three, four minutes, uh, pray what we call a popcorn praise, and that is just to praise God for His goodness, praise Him for, for things that He has done, thank Him. So, popcorn praise means that anyone pray. It's like popcorn. It shoots up, you know. And anyone pray, you can pray two, three times or none, uh, just as you feel. And uh, spontaneously, just praise God for who He is. Just give honor to Him in that group until I stop you. And those who are watching it, please don't pray more than five minutes. Then you can switch on the, your televisions and screens again. All right, go for it. Welcome back. Let's pray together before we go into the Word of God and listen to what God is teaching us about practical ministry. Father, we just love you so much. We just come to lift up your name, glorify you. We lift up your presence in this place. We, we need you to come and, and manifest yourself, reveal yourself to us. And Lord, your Word is so powerful and we cannot live without your word and your Holy Spirit. And therefore, we ask that your, your word in, in a form of revelation will come to us tonight. Let, let scripture just be revealed as you speak to us truth and things that we need to understand. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you come and help us. We welcome you as our helper, our counselor, uh, the one that teaches us concerning the things that we are called for. Uh, reveal to us mysteries and things that that you are calling us as church and people into. We don't want to miss the opportunity of being part of your kingdom that's coming. Uh, let us be the body of Christ. Let us be the light that you call your church that's being visible from afar, that we are demonstrating uh, your church, that the church as a city on a hill that's being visible for people. We want to be that church, Lord, the church, the people of your church, that, that demonstrate heaven here on earth. We want to be the extension of you, Father. Your hands, your heart, your voice. We want to speak truth into the lives of people. We want to counsel, heal them, restore them, deliver them as, as you would do it, Lord. So make us extensions of heaven here on earth, Lord. Let your kingdom come and your will be done. 
We surrender ourselves. Come, Holy Spirit, and just work and minister to us. We welcome you in all your ways, your capacity, your power, your glory in revelation. We love you, Father. We worship you, Abba Father, Jesus. You are our Lord and Savior. You are mighty and powerful. You are glorious, the King of the universe, the mighty one, King of kings and Lord of lords. We love you. And we come now and just open our heart to your Holy Spirit, your spirit of wisdom, spirit of counsel, knowledge and understanding. You're so welcome. Amen. Now, for those of you who have manual students, um, you can see in the manual that there on the first page, there I suggest the books that you must choose one from to read as part of your, your work like we've done in the previous modules. That you have to read and evaluate. Um, please look into that. There's some books that we've used for many years, and some of them are really classic and powerful books about uh, the ministry, especially on the, the area of counseling. Um, there's other books that has uh, approach for why the ministry, more than just counseling. Uh, there's obviously a lot of different kinds of ministry, but uh, in, in this training, we focus a lot on helping people and ministry to people. So most of it will touch on the topic that we call counseling of or helping people in their needs or healing people in whatever they need. Now, what we are going to do in this first uh, time is just to talk about the topic of the nature and goal and place of Christian counseling. Is there really place for that? Is there really room for that? Do we need to counsel people at times? Now, why do we mention this? Because there's a lot of churches and theologians and people that say there's no place for that in the church. There's people in different church groups that don't care about counseling and some don't want to get involved. Others say, no, man, preaching is enough. You just preach, and the, the Word must do everything from the pulpit. Uh, but if we study Jesus and the first church and the disciples, you will see that they were many times involved in one-to-one -one, uh, conversations, go into the homes of people, sit with them, spend time with them, heal them where they are, uh, take them through sessions of what we can call counseling, where they are healed and delivered and helped and restored in different ways. So if you study the Bible, um, ministry is happening on a lot of different levels. There's a great room and place for pulpit ministry where you preach and teach, but that's just one part of the greater ministry. And what we are talking here about is the room for counseling people. Is it really God's plan and heart? And you will see there's a multitude of scriptures confirming the fact that God wants us to counsel people. Actually, the Holy Spirit is the counselor. Jesus has been mentioned as the counselor. And uh, so you can't get away from the principle of counseling. Uh, we need to do it on different levels. I counsel people sometimes when I preach to them. I counsel groups. You counsel one-to-one. -to -one. Uh, today I've counseled couples. You sit with them and you give them godly principles. You pray for them and you support them. So there's room for all of this. Now, as we start, I want to read one scripture. Uh, you can just listen uh, if you don't have it in front of you. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 3. I just want to um, read this uh, powerful scripture. Sorry, it's, I've said it wrong. It's 1 Corinthians 2. 1 Corinthians 2 uh, verse 3. 1 Corinthians 2. Uh, now, there's a lot of content, he came to you in weakness and fear, that's Jesus, and with much trembling. Now, no, sorry, it's Paul that is speaking about himself. Now in verse 4, he's mentioning, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. I just wanted to start with that. Uh, that we don't come and we don't minister just in the form of words. But whatever we do is in a demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. And if we don't do that, then we get into uh, what I call secular counseling. And a lot of churches are doing secular counseling. They, they do counseling, 
but it's not in the demonstration of spirit and power. And uh, unfortunately, uh, they call it biblical counseling or they call it Christian counseling, but there's an absence of the manifestation and the power of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, it, it misses its purpose. If, if that's not uh, a demonstration, you can feel and see the touch of the Holy Spirit in that. So uh, I just wanted to start with that scripture um, that, that you know that's where we're going when we talk about Christian counseling. Um, the, the world out there, even the psycholo- psychologists and psychiatrists and medical people don't necessarily like Christian counseling. They don't think we have an answer for people. And uh, we believe we have more answers and more help and more healing than what they actually can offer. Um, and there's nothing as great than ministering to people. You see healing coming to them. If you pray for someone, you see how they, they are emotionally healed. I mean, when you pray for someone and demons come out. I mean, just the the feeling and the, the, the dynamics of God working as you change lives, if you minister to people. I've done it so many hundreds and hundreds of times and see how people have been changed by demonstration of the power and the word of God. And uh, this is a must. You can't uh, miss this. There's, it's such a great type of ministry. And, and in some way, I think it's more fulfilling than many other kinds of work that people are doing just to counsel and touch people with God's healing. Now, why is Christian counseling necessary? That's what we are asking here. What is the world that we are living in? I give you some facts. Uh, There are so many people with emotional hurts and serious personal problems, uh, more than ever before. If Jesus would be here like he was 2,000 years ago in physical form, Remember those years, he was walking in the streets with his disciples. The greatest problems that people had was physical diseases. People were having different kinds of physical sickness. The stress on them were little. Uh, There was no divorces, or let's say little divorces. Uh, No family dysfunctional things that we see today. Um, just, Just listen to what we are facing today. The divorce statistics keep rising. It's going up to 60-70% of marriages divorce, breaking down. Single parents' families are increasing. Half of school classes, if you ask the children, how many of you are in a single parent household, half of the children in school classes are in a single parent home. And that's a different world that we are living in than many years ago. Most mothers are working and leaving the children in the care of other people. You you did not get that years ago. 55% of all working people are single parents. Many couples stay together without the stability and responsibility of marriage. In many instances, the woman has taken the leading role. In many families, there's a swapping of roles where the, the, the men are withdrawing and women have to take all the lead and decisions. Uh, 80% of all suicides take place within the home. Two out of every 10 people will seek professional help for emotional problems. Then uh, psychological institutions accommodate and care for more people than all the other health institutions put together. If you hear what this is saying, there's more people in psychological institutions for psychos for maybe I haven't said that good enough, people with personality problems, there's more people in, in institutions and in hospital wards for psychological problems than in any other together, all the other wards and hospitals. The same apply with medicine. You know that 80, 80%, 8 out of 10 Medicine that's being sold over the counter at pharmacies are what they call psychotropical medication. Medication that needs to change your brain function. Eight out of ten. So 80% of medication are there to bring people into stability to function better. Just here in this brain. So it tells us that, I mean, this is a huge industry 
If you, you know anything about the drug industry, they are the wealthiest people out there. And 80% of all the drugs that they are developing are there to alter brain function, to alter personalities, to bring people into just some peace from a neurotic world that they are living in. So this is the serious world that we are in. And most of you, some of you have, you, you went through it yourself. You saw your family, friends, people working through Most people around you, if you have 10 people around you, half of them use some kind of medicine to calm them down, to get them to sleep, to take their stress level away or something. They, the world is all on tablets trying to survive this world. And something is wrong. And uh, we, we are heavily uh, hoping and trusting that the medicine will help us to survive. While there's another pill that God has given that is powerful if we apply it correctly. And we call it the gospel. It's working very strongly with the power of the Holy Spirit. And if we can take this word and bring it into the power that it's originally been written. And, and bring it in the power of the Holy Spirit. The words in this become so sharp, so delivering, so healing. It takes you out of any situation. And that's why we are there, and that's why you are there, to take this word that seems to be just words on paper, and through the Holy Spirit it becomes explosive material. And you bring this in the lives of people, and it, whoa, it changed their lives. You take this and you give it to them, and it explodes, and it heals, and it changes. Just because... Uh, that's God's word, and it's powerful. It can change any thinking pattern. It can heal. I mean, if there's one, one scripture in this, one sentence that can deliver you from one place and take you into your destiny, just one sentence if you receive that through the Holy Spirit. So why, why is conversion alone not sufficient? Why, why is being born again not enough? Now, we are... We are people that's preaching, you must be born again. That's not negotiable. Every person must be born again. That's the beginning of your journey from the old life into a life of victory. You have to be born again. So we never change that. And that's always your first message to people. From there, you need to say, but that's not enough. To, born, to be born again means that your spirit is renewed. Now your spirit is now in connection and renewed and with God. But what about your soul and your body? That did not change because you, are, you became a Christian. Your conversion just took you away from being a sinner. Now you, now you are not a sinner anymore. You are now saved through Jesus Christ. You are forgiven. Although you are not perfect, but you are forgiven. And you are on your way to be changed. And your soul needs therapy. And a lot of panel beating still needs to happen to get all the dents out. So conversion is not enough. And we've said it many times that if we only preach salvation in terms of conversion, being born again and then it's finished, then we miss a lot of what God wants to do for people. And when we, we, we speak to people and you work with them, I mean, most people have never received soul therapy, being healed. I work with pastors who are in ministry for 20, 30 years, and they come and sit with you, and they've never received soul therapy. Their, their emotions and their soulish area is never being healed. They are powerful in the basic thing of being saved, but they are still operating in the same character flaws and things that they had problems with in the past. One scripture that, that Jesus came and he mentioned it in Luke 4 verse 18 uh, he was referring to Isaiah 61 when he said this in Luke, Luke 4, verse 18. Uh, you know this well. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners, a recovery of sight to the blind, to release the, the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And uh, in Isaiah 61, it was... Some translations translate it that Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach the good news to the poor. The poor is the people who have lost everything in life that has no hope. Good news to them, to heal the brokenhearted, 
to deliver the captives, bring them into freedom. Um, now, if you hear those words, you realize there's far more than just being saved. Because we need to bring people to the good news that change also their soul area, and that is to heal their broken hearts, to bring them into a place of freedom from anything that bound them in every area of their lives. Now, what is the foundation of counseling? I've got some, some remarks coming from Scripture, and one Scripture I love. It's so powerful uh, for those who know Isaiah, um, that Scripture in Isaiah in terms of being prophesied about Jesus. Isaiah 9 verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. Now this is hundreds of years before Jesus came. It was said about him. A son will be born, the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor. Wonderful Counselor. Now, now, in that you hear the word counsel. He will be a tremendous counselor. In his whole being, he will counsel people. Uh, I just wanted you to hear that Jesus is being prophesied as the ultimate counselor in, in his whole being. Mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and the peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over the kingdom established and upholding it with justice and righteousness from time uh, on and forever. Um, now, this is being said about Jesus, that his kingdom will be forever. His government will have no end. And part of his character was that he will be a mighty counselor. Remember, we are just trying to get you to understand you are must be like Jesus. So you need to become a mighty, powerful counselor. Okay? Is that all right? You don't just want to sit on the stoop and watch the flowers grow. You need to become a powerful counselor. If Jesus can be a mighty counselor, won't it be great if we can call you a mighty counselor? Because he, he is living in you. So what he is, you become. People are supposed to look at you and say, wow, you are a powerful counselor. It's no, no, it's not me. It's the one in me that's doing the job. Now, we don't want to spiritualize everything. It's like the guy who was singing, and he was singing so nice. And when they said, wow, you, you, that was great. He said, no, it's not me. It's Jesus singing in me. They said, no, no, it was not so great. You know, we, we spiritualize it, you know, when people say, man, you've preached so well. So, no, it was just God. So, no, the sermon was not so good yet. <laughs> so, let's not be so super spiritual, you know. It's still, it's God coming through human flesh. And it's not perfect yet, but uh, God is working through us. So, uh, that's just the difference between false humility Christian counseling must be based on the Word of God. Uh, to, to Timothy 3, what, what is that scripture saying? Maybe you know it well. To Timothy, it says, All scripture is breathed, breathed from God. All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So the scriptures, actually Paul was referring to the Old Testament because at that stage there was no New Testament. So he said the scriptures, the Old Testament, is fully equipped to teach you in everything of life that you need. Your financial business, in your love relationship, in raising your kids, Everything you need is being given in the Scriptures. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that you can come to full equipping. Now, this is the Scripture. That's why if you, if you see the Jewish people with their kids, you know when, when a, a Jewish child gets to their 
13th, 12th, 13th birthday, they go through their, through their bar mitzvah, um, where they are proclaimed mature, uh, a meal, and all the things. When they get to 12, a Jewish child can give you the whole Old Testament out of their head. They've been trained the whole, what they call Torah. They've been, I mean, that's, that's being driven into them. Since they open their eyes as a little baby, they meditate on the scriptures. They say it, they sing it, they love it, they talk it. It's being put into them. They will, you can ask a Jewish child any scripture, Malachi, and he will start, Malachi chapter 1 verse 1, and he will start giving you the whole book. And they've been raised with the Bible because they know that everything in life for you to become a godly, powerful being comes from the Scriptures. Now, the, the problem is you can know the Scriptures without the Holy Spirit. Then it becomes dead. Actually, religious stuff, it kills you. I, I remember one of my professors who, who knew most of the New Testament in Greek. He would, he would tell us in Greek, you know, turn to that chapter and you will start with the Greek stuff. And... Uh, and you can know it whatever language you want, but if there's no Holy Spirit powerful working in it, it becomes also dead. So it's, the scriptures must be part of when we talk to people. It must be powerful scriptures and actions. Action. Christian counseling must be exercised with the power of the Holy Spirit. That scripture that I've started with, Paul said, I came to you with, with the word of God and a demonstration of power. That's 1 Corinthians 2 verse 5. And maybe you know John 14, where, where uh, Paul, uh, J Jesus is speaking about the Holy Spirit that will come to us, and he calls him the parakletos. That means the, the helper, the counselor, the, the advocate, the one that will be in us to help us. And the Holy Spirit is the one that is actually counseling. When I sit with you in a counseling setting, and you sit in front of me, actually the Holy Spirit is here, and he's counseling you. I'm just here to facilitate the process between the Holy Spirit and you so that you can get his healing. So at the end, I'm not the counselor. I'm actually introducing you to the counselor, the Holy Spirit, the Parakletos, who's working actually through me, but he's also in you. So he's working in his whole process to counsel you. You know, when people come and, and ask us, you know, uh, who gave you the right to counsel people? You say, no, no, I'm not the counselor. I'm just working with the, the great counselor. And then they say, well, who's the great counselor? I say, no, that's the Holy Spirit. Uh, I'm just facilitating his work with people. So if you have a complaint about the counseling, complain it to him. He's the one counseling the people. I'm just watching. I'm just there to, to get the two together, this person and, and the Holy Spirit. And, and they heal and they do the, the whole work. Uh, Christian counseling requires intercessory prayer. Uh, Romans 8 says that we don't know what to pray, but the Holy Spirit help us to pray through us uh, with, with words we don't even know, you know, an utterance. And, and, and when we speak to people and pray with them, you need to just close that whole session. As you start during the session talking to people, you have to pray. Holy Spirit, help us. You have to intercede. Sometimes when we do prayer, you know, and ca counseling, you get someone else to pray for you. You cover what you do in prayer. You pray before the time, after the time, during the time, because the Holy Spirit is helping, revealing to you exactly what you need to do. I remember two weeks ago, I, I, I had to counsel a, some, a difficult situation, people in ministry, and I was a little bit uneasy with this because I, I, I knew these people have great problems. So I didn't know what to to expect here. So when they came that morning, as I was at home, just praying in tongues and, and trying to sense what God is saying, God gave me a, an idea. Actually, just a sentence. And as I, the people came in and sat in front of me, I, I, I thought, all right, I need to test this, whether this is from God. And, uh, and, and only the thing I got from the Holy Spirit was, ask the person, what was the name, your nickname that they call you as a little one? That was all. So when I asked that thing, the whole thing exploded. I mean, when I asked him that, the guy said, wow, you, you don't want to know. This is ridiculous. 
And then the whole story started. And from that thing, the whole thing opened up. Just one thing that the Holy Spirit showed me. And that is just by prayer you get the answer in to know what to say and what to ask. All right. What's the goal of counseling? What do we want to attain with counseling? Obviously, we want to heal broken people. We want to heal broken hearts. Now, for those who know Galatians 6 verse 2, uh, that says we, we have to carry one another's burdens and fulfill so the law of Christ. Galatians 6 verse 2. Carry one another's burdens. So you need to be involved in people around you. You have to carry their burdens. You know, you're not there just that other people carry your burdens. We are there to carry one another's burdens. And actually in Galatians 6, it talks about uh, you carry one another's heavy burdens. And if it goes down, eventually it says carry your own light burdens. So there are certain things that you have to carry yourself. But the heavy stuff, we help with one another. And counseling is part of helping people to carry their burdens. Then counseling is also, Matthew 28, the process of making disciples. Jesus said, go and make disciples. When I sit with someone, I'm actually very intense, busy making a disciple out of you. I'm talking to you. I hear what is wrong. I listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying. Now I bring God's discipline and guidance into your life. And you know something that, that God is, just this weekend I was hearing it very strongly. The Lord says, you know, when you work with people, the more you circumcise them, the greater sons they become of the Father. And it's actually not something we want to hear. Who, who like to be circumcised? <laughs> and uh, that's obviously an Old Testament term, but in the Bible they use circumcision as a thing of the heart. Your heart needs to be circumcised. And you know what I've seen? The more I work with someone and they allow me to circumcise their flesh, the things that's wrong, the greater person they become. They are just blossoming. The more circumcision you allow from your spirit, your father, or the counselor, the leader in your life, the more circumcision, the greater your personality develops. Now, don't resist circumcision. Don't resist that God cuts out of your life things that need to become. That's all part of discipleship because it means discipline. Discipline. To make people whole in Christ, uh, the word sozo, some of you might remember. What does the word sozo mean? When I minister to you and I bring sozo, remember when I, we did the, the healing seminar? <clears throat> and in the healing seminar, I said there's some different words in healing. One of the words is therapio, to heal people. Therapy, therapy that's just normal healing. And then I said there's a great word being used in the Bible. When Jesus said to someone, he said it three times, your faith has made you whole or complete. He used the word sozo. Your faith has made you sozo. That complete means spirit, soul, body, relationships. I've healed you. I've made you complete. So counseling is very powerful on, on, on helping people not to just be healed in one area, but to make you complete in all the areas that you need ministry uh, to. Then I said to be a true Christian of, uh, citizen of the kingdom of God. And uh, just to explain that, you know, Someone who is a real kingdom citizen is someone who are a worshiper of God. And I, we call it to minister to God. And a very few people can do that. But to minister to God out of your spirit. And then secondly, to minister to other people. Thirdly, to minister to the world. And if we get someone who can do those three things, to be a minister to, the, to God, to people around me, and to the world, that means you become a mature, usable instrument in the hand of God. You're not about just me, myself, and I. My whole life is just about me surviving. You are, you've come out of the selfish lifestyle and to say, Lord, my first calling is to worship you, to minister to you. Secondly, is to minister to people. Thirdly, to minister to the world. And if you become a worshiper, it will flow from God to the people next to you, to those far away and ministering to them. Matthew 10 the scriptures, uh, that scripture says, as you go, preach, heal, deliver. Freely you have received, freely you, you can give it away. And as you go, as you go to your work, as you go to your friends, 
you actually go there to minister. You, you are called to minister. There's not one of you that can say, I, I, I'm so glad God didn't call me. The calling of ministry, practical ministry is for all of us. And you need to, to say, Lord, show me where, how, when, what. Christian counseling in, in, in relationship to secular counseling. Quick, quickly, just some principles there. Secular counseling is based on, on principles of know yourself. Secular means the people out there. If you go to a psychologist, to, to medical people, to the system out there, what do they teach you? Know yourself, analyze yourself, help yourself. You can do all things. And that's not what God is saying. And Philippians 3 actually call them enemies of the cross. They are actually operating against what God wants us to be. Most psychologists and psychiatrists and marriage counselors and self-image schemes are secular and humanistic institutions. Now what is humanism? Humanism. Human, the word human is us. Humanism is the worship of the person. Worship of people. What is humanism saying? Humanism say that I can do all things. And that's a lie. You can only say, I can do all things through Christ. That strengthens me. So you cannot do all things. But if you go to these people, you can go to businesses and they have seminars and things on. They teach the people you can do all things. They teach the guys to walk on the flaming coals. You know, you walk over the coals and you can do it. You know, if you can say it, you can do it. You can focus on it. Um, your mind over matter. And they teach you all these things that we call soul power, and it becomes actually demonic power, and they operate in all of that, and they miss the power of God. And, and, and it's the world system out there, and, and we are there to get people to be dependent on God, not dependent on myself. You can do it. Actually, the Bible says you are a mess if you are not saved through Jesus Christ. Everything you do is just one big mess. But the moment you are restored by God, God, you are a powerful instrument in his hands, and he can use you. So that, that's the news that you get from humanism. That's the same news that we get from New Age movement. New, new Age, it's all over. You see it in colors. The people are using your, your crystal stuff that's all over. Uh, there's such a lot of New Age things around us. Uh, I see even some of the people in our church have, have you know, they are falling into some new age the the theologies that they don't even realize. You know, you have a lot of um, angels. A angel worship is not the angels of God. That's actually demon worship. And a lot of people have these little angels in the house. It's all part of, of actually demonic occult worship. And people have crystals. Um, I mean, there's just now some of our people that... Um, their friend did some crystal cleaning in their house. And they, they are good Christians. And they came in to, to clean the house with crystals, put crystals and all entrances and stuff. This is demonic, but it's part of the New Age thing. And the New Age is a mixture of demonic and humanism. They won't say it's Satanism but it's still demonic. and It's out there and a lot of people are involved. So we need to realize as Christians and Holy Spirit people, we need, we preach a different message. So the goal of secular counseling, you see it there, uh, they want to bring happiness. I mean, you go to the guys who are not Christians, they want to just make you happy. You know, if you're happy for a week, that's fine. Well, we are not there for that. We are there to bring you to a lifestyle of complete fulfillment. Joy, joy, joy. And that's a permanent state of peace and joy that the world can't give you. They say personal problems are just a result of the broken world of sin and uh, of a broken world. We say, no, it's sin and Satan. Uh, personal problems are the result of other people um, that's out of your control. Uh, the secular world will blame the world and say, they don't say you take control of the sin in your life. Sin is sin. If you've done something wrong, you acknowledge sin, and God forgives you sin, and He'll deliver you from your sin and your wrongdoing. Uh, that's the message of us as Christians, and uh, the world are not preaching that. 
They are saying that our people there say there's no everlasting truth of absolute standards. So they say if you want to live together, if you want to do certain sin, if you think, think it's okay, it's okay. We say no, no, no. It's just one principle, and we apply this. I say, yeah, but the Bible is, is not, you know, one scripture is saying this, and, and it's, it's speaking against itself, and so on. That's a lie. This Bible speaks in one voice. If you, if you, if you get someone who, who preach this through the Holy Spirit, you will just hear one voice, one principle. It comes to you. It's not negotiable. God just, God is not, you know, he's not schizophrenic or something. He speaks one voice. He knows what he's saying. And uh, we are preaching that. Um, so let's close this session just in summarizing it. Godly goal for Christian counseling. Isaiah 61 verse 1. We've, we've mentioned that just now. Uh, and all of you should know that scripture in your heart. Uh, Isaiah 61 verse 1 says, God has anointed me to preach the good news. And out of that we hear to heal the broken heart. Bring freedom over the captives, deliverance, open the eyes of the blind, that spiritual turmoil in their lives, comfort those who are brokenhearted. And uh, so let's summarize this. We are there to reconcile people with God, all of you, to help people to evaluate themselves thoroughly on terms of what the Bible says. I've just spoken to someone today who, who disciplined these children totally wrongly. So I just gave him what God says. And then he said, oh, so I'm doing it all the years wrongly. <laughs> I mean, he's killing his children. He thinks he can do it on behalf of God. And that's not God's style. And uh, so I need to give him the scriptures. Then, I mean, I'm talking about someone who's a pastor. And then he said, all right, I, I realize I'm doing it wrongly. So the scriptures bring you in line, bring you back, uh, reconcile you and Bring you back to principles. Help people who have applied the cross in their lives. Number four, restore the weak and carry their burdens. Number five, to destroy the, the works of the enemy, the devil. Number six, to minister wisdom by means of counseling. Um, and we have a lot of wisdom because the spirit of wisdom is living inside. Number seven, to heal the brokenhearted. There's so many around you. Number eight, to com comfort those who mourn, those who are broken. And this is a great, great, great ministry we have. And if you just say, Lord, use me, show me, you will be busy forever. But you need to allow the Holy Spirit to come upon you. The Spirit of the Lord is upon you. Without the Spirit of the Lord upon you, you can't do anything. I've got people who want to do counseling but they don't have clients. No one comes to them. They say, Sarah, can't you just send me some people that I can counsel them? I said, no, no. You have to get the Spirit of the Lord upon you. Because if you have the Spirit of God upon you, people will stand lines to get to you. I can't give you clients, people. The Spirit of God will give you your ministry. So everything starts with God's Spirit upon you that releases you into ministry. God wants to use you powerfully with people. You just say, here I am, Lord. Fill me. Mobilize me. With your spirit and your wisdom, we can heal this world. Let's take a short break and then we come back for the last part.